Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at least, on my review of The Secret of Cold Hill by Peter James, You Cannot Bury Evil. So this is the sequel to The House on Cold Hill. I actually was sent an ARC of that. Uh, I've been a fan of Peter James's for a while, like I follow him on Instagram. He knows who Biggie is because he's seen a photo of Biggie with some of his books. And yeah, I enjoyed The House on Cold Hill and this is the sequel to it. It's kind of a haunted house story. He's actually mostly known for his Roy Grace series of crime novels. Um, but he does a bit of horror here and there and he's also done like thrillers in the past. He's one of those authors who I'm trying to slowly but surely read everything that he ever wrote. So I'm going to start by reading you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out my tabs. Uh, I will come back tomorrow with some more tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. Cold Hill House has been razed to the ground by fire, replaced with a development of ultra-modern homes. Gone with the flames of the violent memories of the house's history and a new era has begun. Although much of Cold Hill Park is still a construction site, the first two families move into their new houses. For Jason and Emily Danes, this is their forever home, and for Morris and Claudette Penn's Weedle, it's the perfect place to live out retirement. Despite the ever-present rumble of cement mixers and diggers, Cold Hill Park appears to be the ideal place to live. But looks are deceptive, and it's only a matter of days before both couples start to feel they are not alone in their new homes. There is one thing that never appears in the estate agent brochures. Nobody has ever survived beyond 40 in Cold Hill House and no one has ever truly left. So I will say um, we mainly follow Jason and Emily. Uh, we do see the Pensweedles as well, but they're very much like the secondary characters. They're also much more annoying. Although, um, if, if you've ever read the uh, Doris books by Charles Heathcote, they kind of remind me of uh, Doris and Harold, um, in that they're this kind of older couple. They're kind of bickering, but they also love each other. Uh, he's a bit more cantankerous and humorous, and she's much more like Hyacinth Bouquet from Keeping Up Appearances. So Jason Danes as well, he's a bit of a germaphobe, and he says, No one realises quite how many germs are spread by hands. The average bowl of peanuts sitting on a pub bar counter contains 12 different traces of urine and 5 of human faeces. Which is true, I've heard that fact before. Well, I mean, I think it's true. I've heard that fact before. Whether it is true or not is a different matter, you know? So Morris calls his wife high command when uh, she's not around. And uh, he says that the secret to a happy marriage is happy wife, happy life. And she very much wears the uh, proverbial trousers. He's actually recently been made redundant and um, she doesn't realise quite how strapped for cash they are, you know? And he doesn't want to tell her. And uh, so we get this little bit of conversation here, which sort of builds some character as well, but also has a little bit of French, which I enjoy. So we get, uh, he hesitated and smiled. Although I suppose, of course, Droit de Seigneur might be rather nice. Droit de what? He smiled again. The ancient right of the Lord of the Manor to deflower any local virgin. Dream on, you wouldn't know what to do with a virgin. She tried to stop herself in mid-sentence, but it was too late. It came out. Quite right. I never had that experience, my dear. He delivered the trump card she could not defend against. She'd lost her virginity to his original best man three weeks before their wedding. Morris had caught them himself in flagrante. It was a hold over her that had served him well for three decades. I don't think I would still marry somebody if that happened. And so then uh, back to Jason and Emily, we get this. Um, I love you to bits too. She looked into his eyes. As soon as we get straight, can we get a puppy? He frowned. I'd rather have a cat, they're cleaner. He patted her tummy. Maybe we'll soon be having some of our own kittens, finally. I'd like three, ideally two boys and a girl. Two boys, that's what royalty call an heir and a spare. It's very true, I've heard that before as well. And so James told Emily at one point, um, if someone hasn't made it by 40, they're never going to. Well, I'm 32, I, I better get pull my socks up. And um, so as it, as it said in the blurb, no one in the house has lived past 40 and Jason's 40th is coming up soon. And uh, Emily says, what did he mean about no one in the old house ever living beyond 40? He was talking about the past, Jason replied. Life expectancy in the 19th century was about 40 for a male and I think about 42 for women. But that took into account infant mortality, death in childbirth, wars. It's very different now. And uh, we get um, the Penn's Weedles. I rest my case. He gave me the creeps. Just a miserable old git who doesn't like change. Reminds me of that Oscar Wilde line in one of his plays. Poor daddy's like a pot plant abandoned in a dark corner, wondering where the sunshine has gone. Marvellous little line there. Don't remember that from any Oscar Wilde plays though. And later on we get, he put an arm around her. Did you ever see that cheesy old movie, Love Story? She shook her head. There was a line in it which became the catchphrase for the movie. Love means never having to say you're sorry. 
And actually one of the things that his character is kind of known for is that he knows loads of quotes and aphorisms and all of that stuff. So for example, another one here, he says, There's an ancient Mesopotamian saying that four fingers stand between the truth and a lie. And if you measure that, you'll find it's the average distance between a person's ears and their eyes, which... Yeah, yeah, about right. I'm probably... I'm like three fingers. Are they? And uh, Emily says, meaning? What you see is what you know to be the truth. And there's lots of like sinister goings on. They keep hearing voices. One of the like recurring things that they're kind of haunted by is they'll have a conversation. They'll be like, we're going to be happy here forever. And then suddenly they'll hear a voice go, no, you won't. And it'll be coming from the TV that keeps like turning itself on. Uh, they also keep seeing people that don't really exist both in their own house and some of the other empty houses. The, what is it, the pens? Yeah, the pens weedles, uh, they keep s uh, smelling a guy with a cigar. Um, it's actually been a while since I read the first book, uh, the one that preceded this, but I imagine a lot of that is like tying back to that as well. Um, but I guess it shows that you could read it as a standalone as well and you, you know, you're still gonna enjoy it. And um, yeah, then this guy, Jason is in his, in his attic uh, studio working on one of his paintings. And he looks out the window and he basically watches an accident happen on a construction site. So a guy's out there having a cheeky cigarette. And he basically gets caught by um, a crane. So I'm just going to read this out. Um, he watched the two halves of the clamshell bucket of the crane open, swinging from its cables, dropping jerkily, hovering over the top of the stack, two huge jaws over the man. Then, like a bird of prey, it dropped, pouncing, momentarily blocking him from Jason's view. The two halves closed together, scooping up rubble, then rose sharply again, with something dangling from them. Oh, Jesus, no. It was the skyver being hoisted in the air, his head invisible inside the jaws. All Jason could see of him was from the neck down, body twitching, his legs kicking, work boots flailing. Abruptly, the grab bucket stopped with a jerk in mid-air and opened. The skyver's torso plummeted like a rag doll, 20 feet to the ground, toppled sideways and lay still. Blood spewed from his neck. A second later, something white fell from the bucket, bounced on the ground near the motionless body and rolled. As it did so, something tipped out of it. Jason stared in utter horror as he realised what it was. Oh, Jesus. He turned his stomach heaving and threw up on the studio floor. A nice little bit of horror right in there. And another thing, Jason doesn't like hospitals, so he has an accident and kind of cuts his head open, but he doesn't want to go and get it seen to, because he says, hospitals give me the heebie-jeebies, and they give me the heebie-jeebies too. Something about the smell. I just ugh, don't like being in hospitals. Uh, he realises that the vicar reminds him of somebody. Alan Rickman, the actor who had died a while back. I love Alan Rickman. And I realised it's been like six years since he died, or five years. Another one of the quotes that Jason thinks about is an H.G. Wells one. I never drive a motor car in France because the temptation to run over a priest would be too great. And then he discovers that nobody actually remembers speaking to this priest. He's the only one who remembers it and we get... But the vicar had come to their house yesterday. He'd talked to him. They all had. But now neither Emily nor Louise could accept it. Why were they denying it? He knew the human brain could do strange things, sometimes to protect people from shock or horror. He'd also read about a study of a remote South American tribe who lived in a rainforest and had never been exposed to the outside world. One experiment that had been done was to fly a helicopter over their village and then ask members of the tribe to describe what they had just seen. Almost all of them denied they had seen anything. It turned out it wasn't because they were being difficult or because they were stupid. It was that the helicopter was so far beyond anything they'd ever seen or experienced, they did not know how to process it. Interesting. And then he goes to a library and I think this is, you know, quite relatable for a lot of people. It was a while since he'd last been in a public library, but that smell seemed exactly the same in each one he'd ever visited. It was a smell he wished he could capture with paints. The smell of books, of paper seeped in knowledge, learning, information, fun. He glanced at rows of shelves, the spines of countless volumes. So many books, and he'd only read a tiny fraction of the ones he wanted to. And he knew, sadly, he only ever would. He squirts hand sanitizer on his hands because of his uh, germ phobia. But again, that was interesting because this was this kind of, kind of came out in 2019 before we were all super used to using hand sanitizer all of the time. We also get a reference to him drinking a coffee that used oat milk because Emily was sure it was healthier than cow's milk. Well, Emily was correct. And then he sort of sees his own death, which is sort of an indicator of how the book's going to end. That's all I'm going to say. Emily was at the wheel. He himself was sitting beside her in the passenger seat. Not possible, no, not possible. Oh God. 
The purple car struck the van head on in an explosion of metal splinters, steam, flying shards of glass as thick as a cloud. The van catapulted backwards and sideways, rolling over and over. He heard the sickening metallic boom. The Penn's Weedles car carried on, the bonnet crumpled, careering across the road and head on into a tractor with a bulldozer bucket that was thundering down the street from the same direction as Emily. The shovel sheared the roof of the car almost clean off. A few yards on, pushing the crumpled wreck of car on its path, the huge vehicle stopped. Jason saw the driver in the cab smiling with grim satisfaction. He looked like Albert Fears. It was Albert Fears. Jesus, no, no. Morris Penn's Weedle's torso sat behind the wheel of the roofless little car. The headless stump of his spine struck up through the blood-soaked anorak and woolly scarf. Uh, so that was actually him seeing the neighbours get in a, in a car accident as well. He sees a lot of accidents. Um, but yeah, that's about all I want to share in terms of the tabs. I will say this was a very well written ghost novel. Um, lots of like suspense, some great like horror and gore moments in it as well. It kind of reminded me of James Herbert a lot of times. The only problem is it's one of those where the main characters just constantly seeing this weird stuff like all the way through. They're seeing all of this weird stuff. They realise very early on like, oh, it's probably haunted. And then they just sort of stay there. But then every time something new happens, they're like, what's going on? It's like, mate, you know it's haunted. You know it's haunted. It's the ghost. Like, it's obvious, mate. So, um, yeah, it was kind of infuriating for, to, to that um, you know, side of things. But other than that, very well written ghost story. Probably a week, four out of five. The ending I did see coming a bit as well. So that dropped it in its, its estimation for me. But overall, did enjoy, would recommend. And uh, the first book in this series was pretty good as well. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Secret of Cold Hill by Peter James. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.